Today, we've had a national tragedy. Two airplanes have crashed into the World Trade Center in an apparent terrorist attack on our country. I have spoken to the Vice President, to the Governor of New York, to the Director of the FBI, and have ordered that the full resources of the federal government go to help the victims and their families and, the, and to conduct a full-scale investigation to hunt down and to find those folks who committed this act. Terrorism against our nation will not stand. As these scenes of destruction played out on televisions worldwide, it was almost impossible to believe this was real. It was so unexpected, so unfathomable. On this perfect autumn morning, out of the clearest blue sky, had come a murderous black storm of hatred. American Airlines Flight 11 departed Boston for Los Angeles, hijacked by suspects armed with knives. This plane crashed into the World Trade Center. United Airlines Flight 175 departed Boston for Los Angeles, was hijacked and crashed into the World Trade Center. American Airlines Flight 77 departed Washington Dulles for Los Angeles, was hijacked and crashed into the Pentagon. United Airlines Flight 93 departed Newark for San Francisco, was hijacked and crashed in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. The events of September 11 shocked and horrified people around the world. This was an attack on innocent civilians, ruthlessly calculated for maximum loss of life. It struck at the soul of America, leaving a trail of ashes, horror, and shattered illusions. Terrorism on American soil had become an ugly reality. Things would never be the same again. Tuesday, September 11, introduced itself as a pleasant, sunny morning. New Yorkers set about their usual busy weekday routines, and the city thronged with people. Little did they know that events were already unfolding that would make this the darkest day they had ever known. At the World Trade Center, more than 14,000 workers and visitors were already inside the Twin Towers. Outside, a plane appeared amidst the dense city skyline. Within seconds, it slammed straight into the North Tower and its fully laden fuel tanks erupted. People stared in horror, wondering how on earth this plane could have strayed so badly. Another one, another one, there's another one. Then at three minutes past nine, they understood. Hijacked flight 175 aimed deliberately for the South Tower. Thank you. 
Both towers were now burning fiercely and toxic fumes filled the interiors. All elevators and stairwells were destroyed, except for one smoke-filled death trap in the South Tower. Emergency services raced to get people out. For a full 30 minutes after he was told America was under attack, President George W. Bush remained at an elementary school. The leader of the country took his time getting down to business. At 9.37, American Airlines Flight 77, with 10,000 gallons of fuel on board, plowed into one of the five outer walls of the Pentagon, triggering a massive fire. Just seconds before, Secret Service agents had whisked Vice President Dick Cheney to an underground bunker. By now, national security knew of at least four planes that had been hijacked. This accounted for the third. The plane approached so low, it actually knocked out streetlights and skimmed a vehicle on the road. Approaching at full throttle, the Boeing 757 literally screamed into its target. All 64 people on board were killed, as well as 125 Pentagon employees. For the first time, the US implemented an emergency suspension of all commercial flights. US airspace was shut down. In the South Tower, fireballs had ignited combustible material and huge fires raged. Heat-weakened steel columns leaned inwards and the topmost floors sagged heavily. Police aerial crews reported the tower buckling and leaning and NYPD ordered its people out. The fire department wasn't told. From the top down, the building collapsed, gaining velocity as successive floors cannoned downwards in just seconds. Clouds of ash, powdered gypsum and pulverized concrete poured into the air and spread blanketing the entire surrounding area. Many people in the South Tower evacuated after the first plane attack. Several, however, had stayed, being told the site was safe. Those who walked out alive were lucky. The streets were littered with remnants of the buildings and its inhabitants. Still around, guys, still around. God bless you. We'll make it. There was so little to separate life from death. Uh, big boom, come down the steps, everything fine till we got to the basement and everything just fell in. Uh, I got trapped under there with another guy, crawled out. Kept getting hit in the head, hit bags all around. Finally, we clawed our way out over the rubble. Yeah. Come on, Dan. We did all right. All right, wait a minute, Tom. Let's go. Less than 56 minutes after the plane had struck the South Tower, it had fallen, and its remnants would continue smoldering for days. 630 people died. On board the last of the hijacked aircraft, passengers by now had heard about the other planes and knew theirs also would create mass destruction. The plane's black box recorded the extraordinary bravery of passengers who stormed the cockpit to wrest back control of the plane. Deliberately and calmly, the pilot flew straight into the ground. No one survived. The North Tower continued burning steadily and people remained trapped from the 93rd story upwards. Continuous, uh, continually trying. Oh, that's great. Also, would you make uh, everyone uh, aware that we're going to be seeing some pain? As the tower came down, it was like a volcanic eruption. 
Ballooning clouds of thick, impenetrable smoke swirled through the streets. <laughs> New York City was like a war zone. The landscape was unrecognizable, a scene from a post-apocalypse movie. The city's lifeblood once pulsed here. Now it was the Valley of Death. Right all the way down. Going to Jersey? Yeah. All the way down at the end of the park. Pardon? Is your name Barry? No, my name's Sweeting. I've lost my wife and daughter. We were in the building when it hit. And I saw the, I saw the second plane go into the building, into the second building. The smoke and ash were yet to settle, but workers had already begun the painstaking search for life, picking amidst the bones of the Twin Towers. No doubt in its early years, the World Trade Center was viewed as the new kid on the block, brash and bold, compared to the elegant Empire State Building. But nevertheless, time showed that each had a special place in the New York City skyline and in people's hearts. After years of planning and wrangling, the World Trade Center opened in 1973, eventually transforming a lagging part of town into a tourism, business, and shopping hub. But two decades later, the world had changed. America and the World Trade Center had become a terrorist target. In February 1993, a large bomb exploded below the North Tower, aiming to knock it into its southern twin and kill thousands of people. It didn't go quite as planned, but killed six and injured many. Survivors struggled to escape down dark stairwells resulting in the addition of luminous markings, which proved vital in 2001. In many events, there are untold heroes. On this day, however, the heroes weren't told what they needed to know. Communications between services were poor. While NYPD personnel were evacuating the towers, fire services members were still searching for survivors. Fire department transmissions did not reach them. Unaware of their peril, 343 firefighters lost their lives. Freedom itself was attacked this morning by a faceless coward Earth. and freedom will be defended. Earth. I want to reassure the American people that full, the full resources of the federal government are working to assist local authorities to save lives and to help the victims of these attacks. Make no mistake, the United States will hunt down and punish those responsible for these cowardly acts. As the North Tower building burned, the neighboring seven World Trade Center ignited and collapsed, unable to be saved due to insufficient water supplies. Almost 10 hours after the nation was attacked, its president returned to the seat of power. At the site of the collapse, the recovery effort continued overnight. Volunteers arrived, some even walking off day jobs to provide their highly specialized skills. Structural engineers, riggers, medical technicians readily gave their time. Experienced manual laborers arrived to donate their services. A team of about 400 trained dogs the largest ever called upon in the nation's history, 
was ready for work. After all this, finally that night, one person was found alive and well. Good evening. Today, our fellow citizens, our way of life, our very freedom came under attack in a series of deliberate and deadly terrorist acts. The victims were in airplanes or in their offices, secretaries, businessmen and women, military and federal workers, moms and dads, friends and neighbors. Thousands of lives were suddenly ended by evil, despicable acts of terror. The day after the attacks, a total of 11 people were found alive. Two of these were former U.S. Marines who had survived for almost 24 hours in a void under 10 meters of rubble. Some survivors were fortunate to have working cell phones, which they used to alert rescuers to their positions. Of those rescued, the majority were emergency workers. When the building came down, um, at one point it was just black. I, I, I thought I was blind, but it was just the soot and it was just the darkness. Um, if it wasn't for me turning on my flashlight, uh, you know, people you know, started to see the flashlight and everybody just started calling out for help. Uh, was trying to help some people there, guide them to some sort of safety, but, you know, I was looking for safety myself. For Americans waking up on the morning of September 12th, it was like plunging straight back into a nightmare. Although it would be a long time before the death toll was confirmed, they knew it would be in the thousands, and survivors would face terrible injuries. To ordinary people, it was unimaginable that anyone could do this to them. And of course, there was the question everyone wondered, how to make sure it couldn't happen again. It's not just a matter of going after the perpetrators, but it's going after and dealing with the sources of support that they have, whether that source of support might come from a host country or other organizations that <coughs> provide them. We have to make sure that we go after terrorism and get it by its uh, branch and root. The primary suspect was Al-Qaeda, which soon claimed responsibility for the attacks. Led by its founder, Osama bin Laden, it is a militant terrorist group established in the late 80s. Originally formed in resistance to the Soviets in Afghanistan, it has gone much further. Al-Qaeda seeks to install an extremist form of Islam throughout the world, overthrowing regimes it considers non-Islamic. It vows to keep Muslim countries pure by expelling Westerners and non-Muslims. It favors violent acts against its perceived enemies and actively pursues weapons of mass destruction. This footage captured by American forces reveals Osama bin Laden's complicity, the coldly calculated plot to maximize death and his delight in the results. Following withdrawal of the Soviets, the Taliban in Afghanistan dramatically increased their power base. Practicing an extremist interpretation of Islam, the Taliban shared ideologies and fundamentalist views with Al-Qaeda. They offered Osama bin Laden a protected base, and in turn, bin Laden's connections helped channel military resources and training into the country. The American government now confronted the root and branch of the terrorism that had struck New York. Tonight, the United States of America makes the following demands. 
on the Taliban. Deliver to United States authorities all the leaders of Al-Qaeda who hide in your land. Give the United States full access to terrorist training camps so we can make sure they are no longer operating. These demands are not open to negotiation or discussion. On October 7, 2001, the United States, with some allies, invaded Afghanistan. Supported by the Afghan Northern Alliance troops, the United States used aerial bombardment and ground attack to break the Taliban al-Qaeda stronghold. The military training camps were destroyed, and the Taliban and al-Qaeda groups were forced into hiding in the remote and rugged mountains of Afghanistan. Here, they were again bombarded but not captured. The village where the Taliban headquarters had been based was almost completely destroyed. Yes, our nation has been attacked, buildings destroyed, lives lost. But now we have a choice whether to implode and disintegrate emotionally and spiritually as a people and a nation, or whether we choose to become stronger through all of this struggle to rebuild on a solid foundation. And I believe that we're in the process of starting to rebuild on that foundation. 2,973 people died on September 11, 2001. Countless others were injured. Untold numbers lost loved ones. Many of the victims were never found. It's almost like you wish that the digging would never have ended, because as long as we were digging, there was always the hope that we would find our loved ones. Now that hope is gone. Throughout its turbulent history, Afghanistan has been continually plagued by conflict and violence. Late in 2001, it suddenly became center stage in a new theater of war. The September 11 attacks on America pitted Al-Qaeda under its leader, Osama bin Laden, against a world superpower. The war on terror had been declared, and some of the greatest military might in the world mobilized to eliminate Al-Qaeda at its hidden bases in Afghanistan. In one of the most rugged and mountainous countries in the world, Pockmarked with caves and hideouts, American and Allied forces went on the hunt for Al-Qaeda. They received crucial support from local Afghans in the form of Northern Alliance. This was a coalition of ethnic groups, once bitter enemies, who had united against a common enemy, the Taliban. Since the mid-1990s, the Taliban had steadily risen to power, adopting an extremist interpretation of Islamic law that was repressive and violent, spreading misery and fear throughout the country. Neither Al-Qaeda or the Taliban were soft targets. The war in Afghanistan would not end quickly 
all sides were in for a long haul at great human cost. Strategically located in Central Asia, Afghanistan is landlocked and borders six other countries. Throughout centuries of invasion and war, much of its territory was siphoned off by foreign imperial powers, and the country now contains a complex and often uneasy mix of ethnic, religious, and cultural groups. In the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, modernization gave women new freedoms fiercely opposed by religious conservatives. When the pro-Russia Communist Party seized power, the conservatives formed the Mujahideen group of guerrilla warriors and civil war broke out. In 1979, the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan in support of the local communists. And in the context of the Cold War, the United States backed the Mujahideen. Fighting in rugged, mountainous terrain, the Russians struggled against the rural tribal forces and the war dragged on, becoming Russia's Vietnam before it finally withdrew in 1989. Russia did, however, continue providing support in funding arms, but this ceased in 1991 when the Soviet Union broke up. And in 1992, the Mujahideen captured Afghanistan's capital city, Kabul. In an ongoing period of anarchy and vicious fighting, Kabul remained a battleground. Many parts of the city were reduced to rubble and thousands of civilians were killed and injured, sparking a mass exodus and refugee crisis. Out of all of this chaos emerged a new group, the Taliban. Mainly made up of tribal Pashtun peasants, they followed the most strict and conservative interpretation of Islam. They first appeared as moral avengers, establishing a degree of law and order, forcing out corrupt warlords who terrorized and robbed local communities. In rapid succession, they captured the city of Kandahar, many provinces, and finally the capital, Kabul. By 2000, they had taken control of almost all of Afghanistan, apart from a small pocket of resistance in the north. In this position of absolute power, the Taliban unleashed a brutal suppression of the people, implementing strict Sharia law. No longer were women allowed to study or work. They were forced to wear a full body covering, the burqa, and were not allowed to leave their homes without an accompanying male relative. Human rights violations, poverty and starvation were endemic. An important figure in the Afghan war was Osama bin Laden. Allegedly the 17th of 52 children Fathered by a Saudi construction billionaire, bin Laden personally led a militia group in the fighting. He also channeled funds into establishing training bases in Afghanistan and setting up terrorist recruiting centers around the world. Following the Soviet withdrawal, bin Laden established Al-Qaeda, and returned to Saudi Arabia a hero of jihad, holy war, for having helped repel the mighty power, the Soviet Union. Soon after, Iraq invaded Kuwait in a move that was seen as a threat to nearby Saudi Arabia's oil deposits. Bin Laden made an offer to the Saudi king to mobilize the Mujahideen to repel Iraqi forces. His offer was rejected and the Saudi government accepted American support. Bin Laden was furious that non-believers, American troops, would be stationed in Saudi Arabia, the center of Islam, with the two most holy cities, Mecca, the meeting place, and Medina, 
the burial place of the Prophet Muhammad. He returned to Afghanistan, where, with Taliban protection, his jihad began in earnest. On September 11, 2001, a coordinated mission of suicide attacks wrought havoc on America. As with religious wars from time immemorial, evil acts were committed, all in the name of good. Freedom itself was attacked this morning by a faceless coward, and freedom will be defended. In global politics, the George W. Bush presidency had been marked by diplomatic tensions, increased protectionism, and a defense expenditure equivalent to the worst of the Cold War years. Following September 11, international goodwill towards American people surged, and the government enjoyed a level of support not seen for years. Tonight, the United States of America makes the following demands on the Taliban. Deliver to United States authorities all the leaders of Al-Qaeda who hide in your land. Release all foreign nationals, including American citizens you have unjustly imprisoned. Protect foreign journalists, diplomats, and aid workers in your country. Close immediately and permanently every terrorist training camp in Afghanistan and hand over every terrorist and every person in their support structure to appropriate authorities. Give the United States full access to terrorist training camps so we can make sure they are no longer operating. These demands are not open to negotiation or discussion. <laughs> the Taliban must act and act immediately. They will hand over the terrorists, or they will share in their fate. Almost immediately, America sought international support to overthrow the Taliban and received a positive initial response from a large number of allies. The Taliban's response to Bush's ultimatum was that they had no evidence linking bin Laden to the attacks and refused to extradite him unless the United States provided that evidence. Afghans in general, uh, and the Taliban in particular, do not usually react positively under a lot of pressure. Um, however, this is a very defining moment for them. And uh, they, I think, must be quite clear about the risks they're running if they do not uh, deliver on the demands of the international community. In Kabul, angry Taliban supporters were defiant in the face of looming U.S. reprisals. Anti-American demonstrators packed the streets, calling for a holy war, and similar protests were held throughout Pakistan. Allegedly, America had planned to oust the Taliban long before September 11. At any rate, Operation Enduring Freedom began on October the 7th, as American and British forces launched a massive assault on Afghanistan. Special forces conducted a high-altitude aerial bombing campaign, drawing on an immense arsenal of weaponry and aircraft. For strategic reasons, attacks concentrated on the cities of Kabul, Jalalabad, and Kandahar. Civilian casualties were high. No country lightly commits forces to military action and the inevitable risks involved. But we made it clear following the attacks upon the United States on September the 11th that we would take part in action once it was clear who was responsible. There is no doubt in my mind, nor in the mind of anyone who has been through all the available evidence, including intelligence material, that these attacks were carried out by the Al-Qaeda network masterminded by Osama bin Laden. Afghanistan's long-suffering people had struggled through drought and famine and endured decades of civil war and oppression. Now, however, with cities under aerial bombardment, it was time to go. Major worry that we have at present is that 
hundreds of thousands of Afghans are leaving cities and heading towards Pakistan. People streamed out of the cities and away from the international aid supplies that already sustained them. Seeking haven in rural areas, they lacked food and water and were ill-equipped for the extremes of temperature, especially winter. Thousands daily trekked over the mountains or journeyed by road into neighboring Pakistan, seeking a new life somewhere safe. Back to go to the United States. My home is there, my children are there, my wife is there. That's why I'm going to go there. In Pakistan, thousands of angry demonstrators took to the streets day after day. Anti-American feelings were at a peak and protesters vowed to wage a holy war against the United States. They damaged American shops, burned effigies of President George W. Bush and destroyed the American flag, burning it, ripping it, even shredding it with their teeth in a mad, frenzied anger. Prior to the rise of the Taliban, Afghanistan had been plagued by ongoing fighting between various groups. Constantly at one another, these ethnic minorities, warlords, communists, and Mujahideen vied for dominance. They were further divided in language and religion, practicing Shia and Sunni forms of Islam. The one unifying factor they had was their desire to be rid of the Taliban, who had swept through the country, taking control of most of it. These opposing groups came together as the Northern Alliance, or the United Front, and were eager to work alongside foreign forces to regain control of Afghanistan. The Northern Alliance performed militia work while the Americans continued with devastating aerial assault. As the war progressed, the weaponry got worse and the civilian toll climbed, with daisy cutters and cluster bombs killing and maiming indiscriminately. The cluster bombs took a terrible toll on children, each containing hundreds of shiny, attractive-looking bomblets, with one in five failing to explode until stepped on or picked up to play with. Under this onslaught, the Taliban were forced to retreat further and further back into their strongholds, the city of Kandahar and the rugged mountainous regions. Along the way, many of the Taliban surrendered or were captured, and the Northern Alliance showed no mercy, performing on-the-spot executions. Hundreds of Taliban were massacred as they attempted to retreat or hide, even as they surrendered. Their holy war was anything but. The city of Kabul is around 4,000 years old with strong Persian roots. Its strategic position on the major Asian trade routes made it a desirable conquest, leading to its turbulent history. In the early 20th century, international investment saw the city emerge as a cultural center with thriving industries and a healthy infrastructure. By the 1960s, Kabul had modernized and women were given the freedom to study, work, and show their faces. In the following decades, endless fighting undid all the development, and by the 1990s, Kabul had been almost reduced to rubble. The American forces and Northern Alliance pushed steadily on towards Kabul, but first had to capture the city of Mazar-e-Sharif, a major transportation hub. While American planes carpet bombed Taliban defenders near the city's entrance, the Northern Alliance successfully captured the airport and military base, enabling the airlifting in of supplies and humanitarian aid. After a bloody battle, the city fell to American and Northern Alliance forces, and the Taliban fled, triggering major celebration on all sides. In quick succession, several provinces fell to the Northern Alliance as the Taliban steadily lost its grip, and its own commanders ran, surrendered, or switched sides. By the time Kabul was reached, 
the Taliban had left. Overnight, they had slipped quietly away, and only about 20 Al-Qaeda fighters remained with little cover. In a short time, they were dead, and Kabul was liberated. The once cosmopolitan city had been decimated. Massive craters from the US bombs were visible throughout, giving a clue to just how much Kabul's residents must have suffered as death and destruction silently rained down from above. Taliban buildings throughout the city had been targeted and were now the center of burnt out ruins. Under the years of Taliban control, neglected infrastructure had crumbled. Roads were wrecked. Electricity and water had long gone. The United Nations estimated 90% of the buildings had been destroyed. The Taliban inflicted misery upon the Afghan people and the battle to overthrow them exacted a terrible human toll. An estimated 5,000 civilians were killed in the first three months, many of them children. Countless more were left maimed and permanently disabled. Whole families were wiped out as they sat down to breakfast. Children were mutilated as they played outside. In just a few short months, Kabul was in worse shape than London after the Blitz. Such was the horrific power of the modern-day weaponry and the scale of the attack. There was little left, but the people were delighted. The Taliban had gone. I feel very happy because the Taliban troops went from Kabul. People of Afghanistan don't like this people. Now Afghanistan's people could enjoy simple pleasures like listening to music or flying a kite. The terror and repression of the Taliban had lifted at last. There were at least some freedoms returned. We weren't going to pay the rent. And they told us, if you come in this area around Wazir Akbar Khan, we will shoot you. With Kabul successfully reclaimed by the Northern Alliance, remaining Taliban holdings quickly fell, and they retreated further towards the mountains. By November 13th, Al-Qaeda forces, most probably including Osama bin Laden, had regrouped at their fortified cave complex in the mountains of Tora Bora. Here, around 2,000 Al-Qaeda fighters took up positions intending to take a last stand against the American, UK, and Northern Alliance forces. While US aircraft rained an incessant torrent of bombs upon the mountain stronghold, CIA and special forces paid local warlords familiar with the terrain to help plan an attack. At last, backed into a corner and facing defeat, Al-Qaeda agreed to a truce and began to surrender their weapons. Every last cave and possible cranny was searched and every last fighter taken. It was then apparent the truce had been a decoy, allowing bin Laden and key Al-Qaeda members to escape, probably to Pakistan. I believe right around the world there is support for firm action now. And I believe the coalition of support for that action is growing. It is strengthening. It is not diminishing. And that is the impression that I have had from many of the conversations I've had with world leaders in all different parts of the world. Because this struggle is something that should unite people of all faiths, mm -hmm. of all nations, of all democratic political persuasions. And I believe it will. Following the initial successful operation instigated by America, the United Nations Security Council authorized the formation of ISAF, the International Security Assistance Force, to preserve the new status quo and keep Kabul secure. This force was made up of troops from 42 nations, with American soldiers approximately one half. It began in December 2001 and still continues in Kabul today.
enjoy your walk around? Yeah, thoroughly enjoyed it. Thanks. Yeah, interesting. How was, how was the reaction from the locals? Sorry? How was the reaction from the locals? Oh, very good. Yeah, very positive. Yeah, excellent. Nice people, lovely people. What did you expect before you came here? Um, thought it was going to be worse than it is, but it's good. Excellent. Cheers. Despite a massive manhunt, the Taliban remained on the loose and continued to wage war against Americans in Afghanistan, where 1,000 US military have now died. Al-Qaeda has spread its operations, making it harder to detect, and now has gained a solid hold in troubled African nations. Afghanistan's future is still uncertain. The Taliban are well-resourced, with access to drug money from the opium trade and the poppy-growing region has become a haven for militants. Extremist Taliban members remain bent on destruction and jihad, but there are other more moderate Taliban members who may yet have a constructive role to play in bridging the divide. Afghanistan needs continued support to assist it to recover its infrastructure, to establish a stronger legitimate economy and a stable government with the means and authority to govern well for its people. Much of this is already happening, with international projects assisting in agricultural, educational, and development programs. Not handouts, but respectful, positive encouragement. Through centuries of external control, Afghanistan has sought autonomy and self-respect. Hopefully, before too long, it can be the proud, independent nation it deserves and wants to be.